Hi. Good afternoon. It's Friday the 13th of September. We're not scared about that 13th, are we? Are we? Um, <laughs> I'd like to uh, take a few minutes and talk about uh, the biological plausibility of the argument that we're making about the social determinant, or as we've softened a little bit, um, the social influences on, on population health, the contextual influences on health. Uh, the ZI in our equation. Context would be time. Most often we think of it as place, um, at least in the ZI. And um, what is the biological plausibility, say, of the linkage between uh, what happens in context and the health outcome? Um, you've already encountered this in a number of places, and one of which was what I sent you today, or this week rather, and um, a kind of a supplemental or an extra, or this week's, I guess we'd say, prof's uh, notes, um, where I uh, gave you the full quote, really, out of a book I have here by um, Alvin Tarloff. He's the co-editor on the um, Society and Population Health Reader. It's a compilation of n numerous essays uh, much much like your text is, which I'm going to talk about here in a minute, the first couple of chapters. Um, uh, an extensive coverage of this. It's a kind of an unusual bo book to come by. I'm not sure I would have recommended it as a text, uh, just because it's so difficult to find. Probably been expensive, maybe even more so than the 40 or 50 dollars you paid for this paperback. But anyway, Alvin Tarloff is in that mix of early, shall we say, social determinants. Uh, determinists and um, a physician and a social commentator, social theoretician on the relationship of context to uh, population health. I met him uh, when I was on uh, faculty of the School of Public Health in Houston. He uh, was helping set up a, uh, how do they call it, a, a health and society center at Rice and some of the faculty on the popu at the School of Public Health in Houston were, were affiliated with that center. Um, an interesting fellow. Um, uh, Richard Wilkinson was there also. He was, uh, I shared an office with him for a little while. Uh, he's a very interesting fellow, uh, very British. Uh, seemed like he wore a tweed coat even in the middle of the summer. And if you know Houston, it's sweltering in the summer, so humid. Um, very British. Um, anyway, um, Tarloff, I think, uh, says a very interesting, states it very well in terms of the um, biological plausibility. But before we go there, I wanted to uh, point out to you that um, in the PowerPoint presentation that I gave in the introduction section of the um, course, uh, that PowerPoint presentation that Social Ecology of Health, the Social Ecology of Health, and one, one of the PowerPoint slides is called The Social Determinants of Health, and there are three bullet points there. And one is, is that this is an approach that examines examine, examine social processes, social structure, and social place as determinants of health. Now, we know that to be the case. That's, why we're, that's really very much part of our theory here. That's our ZI, um, and that was uh, taken from the American Journal of Public Health in 2005. And then there is the hypothesis related to that, how I called it, uh, that is taken from uh, this book, that is our text, uh, Social Determinants of Health. And that hypothesis is the larger the gap in inequality, the lower the health status of the overall population. The flatter hierarchical SES, social economic status structures, are more socially cohesive, resulting in better population health. That hypothesis relates to, uh, say, income inequality, something that's very much a characteristic, uh, characteristic feature of our current society. One of the reasons why we have, although we have so much money, uh, wealth in our society, it's not very equally distributed, um, and so that we have uh, a much higher prevalence of illness and interpersonal violence that we might otherwise expect, and higher than other countries that are, have flatter, flatter hierarchical uh, structures, like say Italy and Greece, but that's a that's the hypothesis. You'll run into this in the second round of reading, which is about social inequality. It's about income inequality, 
and um, and the relationship to that to um, health disparities or health inequalities and in health outcomes. And then the third bullet point is the biological plausibility of that. So what, what causes that? Um, and if you go down the pathway upstream from the context, then maybe the middle part of that stream is about stress. We've talked about this, I think. Stress, uh, as stress elevates, it impairs your autoimmune system, makes you more susceptible to things in the environment, little animalitos and microbes and things like that. And you're more likely to become ill and have some kind of health outcome that you prefer not to have. So there's been a lot of exploration about uh, the biological plausibility of this argument. You have an article in your readings by Bruner, and then the second chapter, which I just want to talk about briefly here in a minute, of the text is a co-authored chapter by Marmo and Bruner, where they more uh, extensively, shall we say, elaborate out the biological plausibility. Pay attention to that, because even though uh, some of us may be in training for to become RNs, or already RNs, or we aspire to go to medical school, uh, and I'm in public health, we may not be all that familiar with the uh, biological argument. And so I think these Bruner article, the Bruner chapter, things by Marmo and all, um, uh, Marmo is a physician. Uh, the, the comments that they make help us make that uh, argument about the biological plausibility. And they're talking about the hypothalamic pituitary um, adrenal axis, which Bruner in the, and Marmo in the second chapter, and to some extent Bruno, Bruner in his chapter or article uh, talk about. But a quote from that is, a low level of psychological stress <coughs> as a feature of daily life results in a subtle but insidious erosion of physiological vitality. <coughs> I'm going to cough a little bit because I got a little bit of cough came up over the last few days. Um, so you can imagine that uh, that fight or flight, that adrenaline rush that you get. Sometimes if you're out walking late at night and there's a sound or a shadow, you'll feel a little chill in the back of your neck. Uh, you can ascribe, ascribe that, ascribe that to a uh, an adrenaline rush, that's a moment of fight or flight. Uh, sometimes you might fight, and sometimes you might flight. But in, uh, that's, a mo uh, that's a moment of acute stress. But in the society we live in, where we are so unequally distributed, and where everything is about pulling yourself up by your own bootstraps, if no other way, or if you're constantly uh, bombarded with what everybody else has so that you can be clear that you don't also have it which is supposed to theoretically give you the incentive to go out and find a job in order and earn enough income so that you can get it or that moment that we've talked about when you're sitting there at the intersection in your barrio mobile and um, and shooting out gas and fumes in the back and and the, somebody pulls up next to you in a bright red shiny beamer and you look at it, and that split second uh, was a, an adrenaline rush. It might have cost you something in the end, who knows. But that constant comparison, uh, even if it's not conscious of where you are in relation to others, uh, keeps your adrenaline flowing. Um, and maybe in a meritocracy like us where you, you become who you become, you are who you become, maybe there's some favorable argument for that, that gives us a drive, a, motiva a motivation to improve our lot. Uh, sociolo sociology spe speaks to that about um, how we move our way up the social hierarchy by better education, better job, better income, and that sort of thing. So um, if, if this is not happening and we have that sort of insidious, constant dripping, shall we say, of adrenaline in our system that is eroding now, I may have mentioned this once before, I probably do because it's a story I tell a lot, um, about how it was in the late 19th century in England, um, how the medical schools used to harvest cavater, uh, cadavers rather, from uh, the pauper's graves, recently planted, of course, and um, would use those as cadavers for science and teaching students, medical students, about organs of the body and uh, bone structure and stuff like that. Well, uh, about the time of the turn of the 20th century, it became fashionable among the wealthy to donate their bodies to science. And uh, when these bodies began hitting the medical school for dissection, uh, one of the early discoveries was that the adrenal gland 
for the uh, wealthy was very much smaller than the adrenal gland for the poor. And uh, the first thought was, my God, there must be a withering of adrenal glands in the wealthy. There must be some horrible disease that is afflicting the wealthy in England. And the story is told by Marmo or Wilkinson. You'll probably run into it in one of the articles. Uh, but it turns out that that wasn't the case, of course. It was that the adrenaline glands of the poor, because they lived in such stressful circumstances, think of uh, the novels, Dickinson's novels of London of the 19th century, uh, they were so stressed, their adrenaline glands were like churning out adrenaline constantly. And so they were, they were enlarged from all of the overwork that they were having to do. And in fact, it was the poor, the adrenaline glands of the poor that were diseased and not those of the wealthy. Um, a very interesting story that points out the logic of the biological plausibility that Marmo, Fuhrer, Etner, and Marx make in this uh, citation that I do in the Social Ecology of Health, and that Marmo and Bruner talk about in the second chapter, and then Bruner talks about in the article. The biological plausibility, we have to, even though we're not, uh, say, medical scientists, and are not clearly uh, clear understanding of what the physiology is, if we can make an argument about what that biological plausibility is to the extent that we can become familiar with it, we need to be aware of it because it helps us make the argument. I make the argument in the community constantly in, in uh, presentations that I do and work I do around the, uh, in the community health assessment. Uh, but of course, for the most part, a lot of those people are already in health, population health, um, public health or at the medical school so they already understand the biological plausibility. But when you're out there talking to um, people who are not maybe directly connected with medical science, um, when they say, well, how does that happen? You can say that. You know, another way that you can think about this <coughs> um, is that when is it that you get, um, I may have mentioned this one too, when, it, when is it that you get the flu? Um, usually it happens about the time that um, you're in finals, and uh, and you think, geez, a heck of a time to get the flu or a cold, and it's probably because you're stressed. Your context has turned for you kind of dysfunctional, too many exams, and you get stressed by that, and that stress um, impairs your autoimmune system and makes you susceptible to viruses and microbes and bacteria, and so you have a higher risk of becoming ill. So that's a kind of our own personal experience, if you will of the social uh, contextual influences or the social influences on population health, our own in particular, let's say. So um, that social ecology of health and some of the argument is laid out there for you. Um, and then I sent you this um, reading uh, this week, or posted it rather, and it's a rather long, I'm not going to read it, but it's, it's a rather long discussion of this and speaks to um, the um, enduring theme, shall we say, of the course, and that is cohesion, social cohesion. If we're socially unequal, or I should say if we're economically unequal, and we are, then um, it's more difficult to, to, for us to be socially cohesive. We're in conflict, we're in competition. Uh, maybe some of us uh, sequester ourselves behind gated communities so as not to be uh, too close to those that don't have what we have, or maybe we're fearful that those that don't have it will uh, come and get it from us, so we have to lock our gates and close in our communities. We have all this kinds of thing going on in our in our society and um, they they put it here in terms of cohesion and that's the argument that we will make and the second segment is about income inequality and looking at the relationship to coronary heart disease and things like that and you'll see it. Um, uh, Marmo speaks to some extent about that in that first article when he talks about the Whitehall study. Uh, stress decreases as you go up the uh, authority hierarchy, uh, theoretically here, at least the way they saw it, and that it increases as you go down, the burden of the work is wider at the base than it is up here. You could always a sort of a story and look and say, well, probably the people at the top have big desks and they're clean, but the people at the bottom have small desks and they're jam-packed with work. You know, these are, uh, we don't want to be, that's not a very scientific statement. Uh, there's stress at all levels. <coughs> But one of the issues related to stress in a hierarchical structure is those at top uh, that have the authority can make the decisions about their own work. And people at, at the bottom end of the hierarchy are 
subject to decisions about the quality and quantity of their work by somebody else. So they're not in control of their work circumstances. And so it's really not being in control of the work circumstance. It really creates a stress that you're doing the bidding of others and you don't maybe not have a real clear role in terms of uh, your own opportunity to make decisions. And that's very stressful. Uh, it's not the work per se. It's the character of the environment in which the work is uh, conducted. And um, so you'll see that uh, in his Whitehall statement. And then the next segment after that we begin looking at social cohesion. That it's not about income because if we see that there are places where income is high but it's more equally distributed then the cohesion seems to be better and where though in those areas where it's more equally distributed then and social cohesion is better then um, there's there's better health outcomes because the biological plausibility that we're talking about here doesn't come into play uh, at least not to the extent that it does for us in this country let's say or in England and places like that um, so I th and then when we move on down, we'll, we'll do social cohesion, and the, the last thing we do is social network, which is really the fabric of cohesion, how well we connect to one another. That is the fabric of the cohesion that keeps us all intact and connected and supportive and, and that sort of thing, uh, both at the societal level, family level, neighborhood level. And um, so we <coughs> have situations there <coughs> where our health is better, shall we say. And we'll, we'll follow through that argument. So that as we move through the argument of our course, where we go from in income inequality, clearly the biological plausibility plays there. But as we get more cohesive, the biological plausibility is there, but it's not so prominent because the autoimmune system in more cohesive societies and communities is, um, you know, the autoimmune system is less impaired, shall we say. Um, at least that impairment that comes from social dysfunction or uh, the lack of cohesion. That's our argument in the course. So the biological plausibility is something really to get your mind around uh, because you, you might well be liking the course and want to talk about it. Um, if you are going into medical school or you're an RN or you're a sociologist or social scientist and you want to work for um, doing research in health now or you want to um, maybe go to school of public health or want to work for a community-based organization, the mental health department. Um, the social science perspective, sociology in particular, and social determinants, the social contextual influences on popula population health is very prominent in the discussion of all of those sectors in, in health that I just mentioned and more that I didn't mention. Uh, so you'd be well prepared to anything that you might encounter out there. And, uh, but to be fairly clear on what the biological plausibility piece of the argument is. We'll speak to it more as we go through the semester. Um, one thing uh, that you, a uh, couple of illustrations I think, um, my infant mortality stuff that I showed you in the, uh, and there are a number of uh, IMR uh, articles in, I think, in that first section of readings. I, I'm sure I put some in there. Um, infant mortality being a, the, um, the canaries, shall we say, that the miners in Appalachia used to use. They would go down the mines. They had no way of detecting noxious gases. Most of the noxious gases, you don't smell them until it's too late. And so they would have canaries in the cages, and if the canaries fell off their perch, well, the miners would get out. And so in a lot of ways, infants are the canaries in our cage. And then when you look at populations by race and ethnicity and class, you find that in some uh, places or some classifications, be it by race or socioeconomic status, that um, the canaries are in serious jeopardy. Uh, canaries are following, falling off the perch. In other words, the mortality rate is much higher in some populations in this country than it is in others. And overall, our population, our infant mortality rate, is higher than uh, maybe 15 or 20 countries in the world, and yet we're one of the top two or three wealthiest. So somehow or another, we're not getting that right. We have a much higher rate of canary death, if I may put it that way, which is a very brutal way to put it. But we have too many infants under the age of 12, uh, 12 months dying than, th than really ought to be the case. In that IMR, that wasn't so much about stress <coughs> directly. This was 19... <coughs> the 1930s, 40s, and 50s in San Antonio as a case study. That really was just about the lack of availability of sanitation and little kids playing in the dirt like little kids would do and then holding their infant siblings 
and uh, maybe picking up bacteria in the soil and then a sibling getting in contact with that and sucking their thumb and getting the bacteria, getting diarrhea related disease, dehydrating and dying. And uh, uh, because there was no, the, the density of fecal contaminants in the soil was so high, um, you know, it was just a natural occurrence, shall we say. And um, so that wasn't really so much about stress, although you can imagine there was stress. Uh, those tenement houses that they called, you know, like in the west side of San Antonio, for example, were called corrales. And if you know what a corral is, it's a place where you enclose animals. They were called corrales, uh, enclosing Mexicanos in those tenement houses. So you, you can bet that there was uh, social and emotional stress uh, on the part of the people who had to live in those environments. But the death of those infants really was more directly related to the density of uh, fecal contaminants and bacteria in the soil. Um, the Frisbee article is a little bit different, interuterine growth retardation. That's environmental also, but that's a social environmental, more representative of the argument that we're making, uh, where the environment is so stressed that, uh, stressful, that the mothers who are pregnant are stressed, and their response to that is to absorb more of the energy of their food than is passed to the um, infants or to the, uh, into the uterus, to the fetus, so that, um, and you know, we don't want to get into the evolutionary argument for why that might be the case. In dreadful circumstances, maybe it's better that the child dies and the mother lives so that children can be produced later when the environment's better. We don't want to get into the environmental ar in, in evolutionary argument, but there, that might be the case that somebody might make. But in this one, um, it's that um, simply that the, the mothers are absorbing more of the energy, less is going to the fetus, and so when the baby is born, it's born full term, but at a smaller birth weight. There's a intrauterine retardation in its growth. Uh, not a mental retardation, but a physical retardation in growth. Um, and as you probably know, most full term, most prenatal, or should I say, um, low birth weight babies are preterm babies. They're born before uh, the full term, 36 weeks or so, is up. And so a lot of their last two or three weeks of growth happens uh, exterior to the mother, if I may say it so crudely. Um, so um, anyway, think about those articles um, and the articles that you're looking at now uh, in the introduction uh, in terms of the outcomes that we, as demographic outcomes, that are often the outcomes we use for measuring <coughs> population health and looking for those gold nuggets of ZIs in those various articles. I think you'll find Frisbee's articles very clear and a lot of uh, out of them well too as you become more um, um, expert <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> in doing the mining. Maybe I've been stressed the last couple of weeks too, hey? or a couple of days, who knows. Um, in that first chapter uh, that Marmo does about the social determinants, he makes reference to the social gradient and it says there that it has shown us how sensitive health is to social and economic factors. There he's making the argument that yes you can see uh, that downstream, when you look upstream, all this variation in health downstream seems to be co-varying with levels of things happening in the context upstream. As the social gradient gets worse, um, health gets worse. So he's making that connection, demonstrating the argument without yet getting to the biological process that lies in between. But you've seen that in my PowerPoint and elsewhere in the readings um, that you're doing for this, uh, this segment. So uh, that, and in there he says, one of the things he says, it's important for us to be able to find the determinants of biological markers, uh, including the behaviors. A lot of the ways that we frame it now in terms of in community health and our interventions is we frame it in terms of social determinants. What is the context? What are the behaviors? And what are the outcomes? And the way we change the outcomes when we think about this, if we can change, help the neighborhoods change their context, change their context like uh, better lighting so they can change their behaviors of exercise, they can exercise, then they, maybe their diabetes wouldn't be quite so bad as a health outcome. Uh, so we think of it in terms of behaviors uh, that result from the context because then in the context uh, the mayor say can work with the neighborhoods to improve the, the context. Uh, Community-based organizations can respond to behavioral issues and uh, like uh, things that have become prominent in the last few years using seat belts and uh, things like that for children and for all of us for that matter and all that within with the idea of improving health outcomes 
but he's expanding this out that we need to look at the biological markers as well. What, are, what is it about the behaviors that are uh, changing? Maybe it's not about the behaviors. Maybe it doesn't matter what you do as a behavior. If you're so stressed, unless of course you do yoga or something to uh, lower your stress or you eat better. Uh, but what are the biological markers? And that's the argument that began making in chapter 2. Uh, which is kind of an extension uh, or complement to the Bruner article that you have as a separate one. Uh, so I think here they're looking at the biological response of the individual and population of the social environment that's acting on them. What is the biological response to that? Just like that uh, evening you're out walking and it's right at dusk and there's lots of shadows because there's still some twilight and you get that rush in the back of your neck. That's a biological response to your environment. Uh, what is a biological response? What is the character? What is the physiology of the insidious uh, response of our adrenaline glands in that axis that he's talking about? Uh, what is that? What is there about the character of our social, uh, our, our society that produces that insidious response? That's what they're talking about in chapter two. <coughs> So, uh, and I might say, one of the reasons why I ran into Wilkinson in Houston was something else that you'll encounter, and that is the um, Spanish paradox, Hispanic paradox. Uh, that article is one that you're reading, and that is the issue is, why is it that um, infant mortality for uh, Hispanic children is lower, um, or lower than what one might expect, given their socioeconomic status. Given their socioeconomic status, you'd expect a much higher infant mortality. Yet, the infant mortality for Hispanics, Mexican origin Hispanics, is very somewhat equivalent to the non-Hispanic white, who on average have a, a much better socioeconomic circumstance. In fact, their socioeconomic in circumstance, uh, the Hispanic or Mexican origins, more similar to African American than it is to the uh, non-Hispanic white, yet um, their infant mortality, their, while their, their social circumstances, economic circumstances are more similar to African Americans, their infant mortality is more similar to, um, to the uh, non-Hispanic white, where the African American um, infant mortality is usually two to three times higher in either one of the other two groups. Um, he, he was intrigued by that. Um, and looking for these biological markers, he came and was doing cortisol tests. Um, the RNs in the group will know what that is, I'm sure. But it's a, um, it's a chemical that's produced in stress, and so that you would expect that in a highly stressful environment, the levels of cortisol would be higher than in other areas where the stress is lower. And uh, so it's a biological marker of stress, shall we say. And um, he was finding in his, in his work that it was relatively true that Hispanics, uh, or Mexican origin, their cortisol levels were lower than expected, uh, just like their IMR was lower. So he was over here for about a year working out of that institute or center at, I mentioned a minute ago, at Rice, uh, but housed in an office at the, at the School of Public Health there at the Medical Center in Houston and doing these cortisol tests. I don't know that he's a medical physician you can, or MD. Uh, you can take a look at his biography and see. Interesting, an interesting fellow. So uh, I think that's pretty much um, what I wanted to say about this. Um, I mentioned the Whitehall study and all of that. Now, one of the things, the next chapter that you'll read, I haven't really specifically designated these in the readings, but I'm going to guide you through these in the video. The next chapter that we read will be early life. And um, when you think about social context, then you can think about the serious consequences uh, that can uh, afflict uh, an infant or a child who's in, shall we say, um, unfortunate, disadvantaged circumstances at an early life. In fact, you'll see there that many of the illnesses begin to happen to children early. Some of them don't even clinically manifest yet. Uh, but they will when they're adults. So many of the illnesses that children have as an adult are the consequence of the circumstances of their very early life. So when we begin thinking about this and we think about what are we doing, my God, to our children, eh? Uh, it, it gives a certain sense of urgency about doing what we can to level the playing field and smooth out the disadvantage, remove the disadvantages. Because if we want to think about it this way, the children that are already around us, in some ways, we'd have to say, and it's a horrible thing to say, have we lost them? 
we've already lost them. We've already there are already environments where uh, their biology their biology has responded ha has been perhaps forever in their lives influenced by that, and as a consequence of that, they'll have a very different path medical path uh, throughout their life um, than they would have had had they been in more uh, shall we say a, a better circumstance. So uh, when we think about and read this third chapter over the next week or two, we have to think about the consequences and significance of what we do. In fact, we'd have to say the significance of what happens in our failure to act. Once we know uh, what's going on here, how can we not act? Uh, then we become advocates, do we not? We get into public health, we get into nursing, we get into pharmacy, we get into uh, working in sociology, and working in community-based organizations, mental health department. We, we become advocates, practitioners, and um, and maybe do research and all. So, anyway, that's the commentary on biological plausibility. Uh, I uh, I enjoy this class. I have yet uh, this week to get up and um, and take a look at the discussion. I I, I think I posted a uh, a discussion thread earlier. I hope I did. Uh, if I did not, I will next week. I know you have an assignment coming up in a couple of weeks having to do with the first round of reading. I haven't heard from very many of you, two or three, so be sure to send me an email. Once you've done your reading, send me an email and say this is the article, Blanchard, that I'd like to read and then uh, be part of, bring into the discussion over the next couple of weeks and do my writing on. Um, and if it means that two or three are doing the same one, it's okay. Uh, the important part of this, uh, this segment is to get familiar from the introduction about the argument that we're making about social determinants and then looking at the why, the outcome, and practicing, looking in those readings of the demographic segment for the ZIs, the gold nuggets in there where people are making references to contextual influences on outcomes even though they may not be specifically saying this is an important thing to think about. Some of them will say that it's an important thing to think about. So. Uh, this is Friday afternoon, Friday the 13th, and uh, there's a weekend coming up. I don't know when you'll see this video. You may see it next week. I'm going to go to the next office next door and turn it into a YouTube video and send you an email and say it's out there. So uh, you all have a safe weekend, and uh, talk to you next week. Eh?